I am Femi Oke and join the stream. Today, what's next for Egypt's revolution? Five years on, we'll look at the challenges faced by Egyptians calling for change. Such an important time of the year when we look back and then look ahead as to what's happening in the Arab Spring as far as Egypt's concerned. Malika Blau, our digital producer, I know you've got a lot on your computer. Yeah. Share. Well, for the most part, Femi, people are looking back. And so right. one of the hashtags that's trending in Egypt is Jan 28th. And that was dubbed the Day of Rage five years ago. And it also marked the time when mobile and internet services were shut down and tens of thousands of protesters were out in the streets. So if you take a look at my computer in Cairo, this is how Ahmed Ibrahim looked back on it. He writes, I swear it was the greatest day of my life where I felt freedom, I felt dignity, and I felt like a human being deserving of life. Hashtag Jan 28th. Now, others are tweeting about this present day. Here's a look at some of the other hashtags that Egyptians have been using this week. In 2011, a people's movement led to the resignation of Egypt's longtime leader, Hosni Mubarak. Since then, Egypt has held its first democratic elections, resulting in a government led by the Muslim Brotherhood. A year later, protests led to a military coup, and now an elected government headed by former army chief Abdul Fattah el-Sisi. In this week's January the 25th anniversary, authorities have stepped up security, arrested activists, citizens, and discourage public protests. So does Egypt's revolution still have a future? With us to talk about this on our set, we have Amira Mikhail. She's an Egyptian rights activist and a fellow with the Tahir Institute for Middle East Policy. By Skype in Doha, Al Jazeera journalist Baham Mohammed. He covered Egypt during the Arab Spring and also spent more than 400 days in an Egyptian prison for broadcasting forced news. And that's a charge which Al Jazeera refutes. And in Berkeley, California, Sharifa Zuhur is a visiting scholar at the UC Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies. So good to have you here, everybody. Really looking forward to your insights. But I have for you this anniversary. How have you heard and seen people marking it five years on? I've seen it on, on, on social media. The thing that started, or, uh, that started the revolution when in 2008, uh, April 6th movement called for the strike and uh, it started with social media. So again, in, in, the, in this anniversary, I'm seeing the social media taking a huge part mm -hmm. of it, seeing people remembering and sharing their memories and saying that they will never give hope. Yes, it might take time, but people didn't give hope. And t speaking to, to, to lots of youth and lots of my friends in different, in different youth movements, and they all still believe in the revolution. They all believe that the revolution will continue. What is happening in Egypt now will pass. It's a matter of it's a matter of time, and military regimes will always fail. Will always fail. And the Egyptian youth who started all this, they broke the, as they say the wall of fear. So there's nothing will stop them. Uh, they still believe in the revolution. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a, let's say a small uh, like a short break and uh, they are working on it. You can see the amount of tweets and you can see the amount of Facebook things that we see about the revolution and uh, day of Friday of rage and uh, and what we see recently by some youth doing this package on the internet for the with the with the security. So, and while Bahir is right, we are seeing exactly that. There are also some people online who are raising calls of alarm. This is Jane Samuels, as she writes in, very concerning, Egypt police raid Cairo homes and check Facebook prior to the anniversary of the uprising, and she links to an article about that. And so within our community, Amita, we had people like Aya say, this anniversary week, there's a shaky stake panicking and spending massive amounts of money to deploy security forces in Tahrir Square. So and no real Januarians are holding protests. She calls them Januarians. Bahadur, what were you going to say? I, I, I say and nobody even called for one protest. 
nobody right. cope or anything. They are panicking, and they are not only searching, they are searching the entire homes in Tahrir Square. They uh, start stopping people in the streets and asking them to open their mobile. And, uh, okay, show, uh, for example, a security officer stops a person in the street and stopping him and telling him, okay, show me your mobile, open your Facebook, and uh, let me see what you're writing. That, what, that what also that? Why was panicking? happening a long time before in Margani Street in near the palace. They had it completely locked off at 12 o'clock at night, every single night, full military security. Um, just and the the military men, when you ask them, we want to get through to go home, they would say no, malish. It has to be after January 25th. High state of concern, for sure. I want to say to people who aren't in Egypt that under the new constitution, this is all a violation of freedom of information. Um, there are all sorts of new promises of that type of freedom that, you know, this. Uh, fear of protest uh, directly conflates, so it's very concerning. See, this takes me back five years ago when I was asking as a journalist, what are people protesting about? What do they want? So when you say the revolution isn't over, Baha, what do people still have to protest about? What do they not have yet? The basic demands they ask for on the 25th of January, bread, freedom, and social justice. Look at people now. After five years of the revolution, people didn't get bread, uh, they didn't get freedom, they didn't get social justice. Even those who were called for the protest in, on, the, on the 30s of June pro, uh, uprising, or let's say riots or prote protest, uh, they are now behind bars. So people are asking for the same things and nothing happened. Even those who are asking for the same rights and the same chance that was in Tahrir Square, when they asked for it after the 30s of June, what happened to them? They are behind bars. Look at Ala Abdel Fattah, look at Ahmed Maher, look at uh, Muhammad Adel, look at Ahmed Doma, and look at other youth from all sects of the political life in Egypt. All of them are behind bars now. Why? So there are lots of concern and lots of violation happening, and none of what we asked for had happened. And the people are continuing that. And some people were making jokes about that, saying, look at the panic in the Egyptian street now. Like, the youth of the revolution didn't call for any protest, and they are staying, sitting at home, and look at the panic with the security and the military. There were, like, some reports on the Egyptian media saying that 400,000 security personnel are in the streets. Why? Why? And I'm but getting back to the point, nothing happened. Nothing happened from the demands of the people. The, the breach of the security of, of, of police, especially police, still happening, still ongoing. We're still hearing reports about torture and uh, torture and abuses inside police station and also inside military. And everybody heard about Azuli now. It's a military uh, prison in Ismailia in northeast Cairo. Uh, all these breaches are still happening up till this moment. So everything we called for in Tahrir, or everything the pe people or the youth called for in Tahrir, not, none of it happened. And we heard lots of promises from right. the current regime or the previous regime, and nothing. So, Bahir, I, I hear you help. saying that nothing's happened, and most of our community is agreeing. But, Sharif, I want to play you a video comment from someone who says, at least one thing changed. This is Nihal Amr, and hear what she had to say. It's difficult to be optimistic about the uh, future of the revolution, given the current state of affairs, but uh, we have to acknowledge that it really has fundamentally changed the social and political landscape within the country, no matter how much the state wants to stamp that out. Um, I think that these extreme repressive measures are indicative of the state's insecurity. Uh, instituting a uh, repressive NGO law, criminalizing protests, are indicative that the revolution is actually very much alive, and that is what the state is afraid of. So, Sharifa, she says the political and social landscape has changed. Those are really big words there. Do you think that that's true? Well, absolutely. Since the time that I was in college in, in Egypt, when we weren't allowed to have any protests directed towards Egypt, we could have a protest concerning uh, Israel bombing Lebanon, we could have a protest concerning Iraq, but at the end of each protest, the police would break in to the campus. So, you know, there was a culture in which we taught and we were taught that Egyptians would never revolt. There, there are books about it, why Egyptians would never revolt. They would use humor instead of revolting. So that's absolutely not true. We know that. Um, 
Let me just bring in uh, Amira here because, um, Sharifa, I wanted to get a sense of some specifics. So let's get an idea of what it's like for your people close to you. For instance, your dad had an accident recently. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get an idea. Egypt, 2015, 2016, what is it like to live there? Your dad had an accident. You pick up the story from there, Amira. <clears throat> well, he was driving from Cairo to Alexandria and the car hit debris uh, on a, of course, a dark highway and um, spun out of control multiple times. For, for a while, I didn't even know if they had flipped completely over, but made it out and they had struck a wall on the side of the road. The military held them for hours, not in detention, of course, but they just didn't want to release the incident until they made sure that damage had not been done to their wall. And of course... To the wall? To the wall. Right. While the debris was still on the highway, former cars hit it, so there was a series of... of it was a nightmare unfolding before us. And you, of course, from, from where I was sitting here in the U.S., I was only thinking, oh, there's that law that was passed that now makes it a terrorist attack to damage public property that belongs to the military or the government in any way. Mm. Let me show you something here on, on my laptop here. This is from the Egypt MFA spokesman. Over the past five years, Egypt has worked to provide better economic opportunities for Egypt's youth. Hashtag Egypt better today. Now, Sharifa, uh, CC was one of your students. You actually taught him uh, for a while, so you know him better than probably anybody else in this conversation right now. How, how do you look at Egypt better today? Is there an aspect of Egypt that is better than it was five years ago? I think uh, it's a positive that there is a president who feels that he has to give the country a report card, which he's done in periodic speeches. There is... Uh, Tell I us mean, about this report card. What does he do? Every month he says, well, we've done this. And give us an example. Somewhat like that. What targets have been reached? Which projects have been started? I mean, the, the overwhelming need simply on the first demand, bread, uh, not to mention social justice, you know, all these areas that have to be vastly improved, education, uh, jobs, planning, uh, traffic, overcrowding, uh, you know, how, how to Shrita. manage this. So uh, one way of saying Egypt is Sh better Sh today Sh is Shrita, that... Baha, Baha wants to talk to you. Go ahead, Baha. Okay. What if, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what improvement ha happens in bread look at the quality and how bread if you just google type uh, the, the, how the bread looks like in egypt and you can see that what economy and job are you talking about you're talking about the, the also new, the matters uh, of social the, the, justice the, the, uh -huh. look look at the, the economic conference that they had in sharma sheikh and look at those businessmen who are who are so called close to the regime are saying that it's 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 nothing there's nothing to offer look at this at new administrative capital look at the new Suez Canal and all, all the, these things uh, when when some journalists went to ask about the new Suez Canal and uh, they didn't give them answers Sharifa he collected lots of money and lots of projects and lots of things have been said and we people cannot see anything let me tell you this I've been in Egypt just before I go people are suffering just to buy some vegetables and fruits so let's let, let's talk about meat and everybody knows about the conditions of meat and this kind of thing in egypt but let me say this people are suffering to have a daily vegetables on their table but i let sharifa answer what, that you, you you've given her a lot to think about sharifa go ahead okay so my brother-in-law is a worker in kafir dawar okay he's uh, for the first time in his life since the revolution he had three pay increases small pay increases and exactly as you say he, they don't have enough money okay but the breakthrough was being able to strike being able to get some kind of a raise being able to think of things changing um and i think i mean philosophically that's where we have to stand otherwise we're in despair if we say nothing is achieved nothing is planned nothing is happening it it's it's not happening successfully, it's not being planned successfully, but it's not that there is no movement whatsoever. I'd like to yeah, add, yeah, I would like to it? ask though, um, we, when, is there right to strike still there though? Is there right to protest still there since the protest laws that were passed have eliminated that from the society? 
I mean, this is, this is the big issue of all of the laws, and it's true, CC has accomplished a lot, and he accomplished a lot by passing 263 laws without a parliament and an actually functioning legislator in the country. So he did accomplish a lot, but a lot to the detriment of the rights that our workers and our normal average Egyptians, including the all the way from the very bottom to the top, require as their basic rights. Is there more stability now? Absolutely not. Hmm. I, I think there is more stability than in August of 2013. I think there have been fewer explosions and IEDs. And I mean, let's not forget the rationale that the and regime is using. Let me just remind using. you, August 2013 was just after President Morsi was overthrown. So then that, that was right. kind of mayhem. All right. So there's, there's, yeah. there's more stability than then. But, but the more stability has yeah. been at the no. expense of civil rights. So that's what we have to look at, is this dilemma. Is there really an uprising all over the country? How dangerous is it? You know, what are, is Egypt forever Shalifa. going to give up certain rights just as under Mubarak's terrorism laws? So I, 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 I do see a justification used by the regime, but there, there were and there are and there remain uh, many different kinds of attacks, most recently in Ghargada and in Giza, and you know, you can look daily, there are uh, incidents. So I'm sorry I, I, I want to pick up on something what? that Sharif has said by showing oh, right. just two, okay. two opinions online. So this one is uh, one I want to share from Jonathan. He says, a day of rage remains a day of rage, even five years later. So the reason for our rage has not gone on the contrary. So that's one side of this argument. The other one shows a little bit of public opinion. This is the big pharaoh who writes, people want the downfall of the regime. And we heard that in the beginning of the uprising. And we are holding on to CC. These are two top contradicting trending hashtags on Egypt's Twitter. So there does appear to be, at least if you base it on uh, Twitter hashtags, support for CC, perhaps support for his anti quote unquote terror laws. What do you make of that and what it does to public opinion just in everyday people's lives? Can I just give examples? Please. Uh, first of all, first of all, compare the number of attacks in Cairo and in Egypt in general and in Sinai during Mubarak time and during Morsi's time and during CC. I think it's way more, way more. I, I, I'm just saying according to what I saw since where I was bailed and since I was hearing news from somewhere when I, while I was in prison and also when I was released. So the number of attacks increased a lot. The number of groups claiming attacks in Sinai is increased. The number of attacks in Sharm, Sharm el-Sheikh and, and Hergada, as she said, is increasing. The number of tourists who have been killed and like the, the, the Russian plane is, is the recent one we're talking about is this is the number, this is the security that we are the security that everybody's talking about, it's improving. No, 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 under, under anything, it, it's not improving at all. We are seeing attacks. Under Morsi, there was no attacks in Cairo. There was no attacks in Giza. It was just attacks in Sinai. And the military was doing an operation there. But when Sisi took power, you're in this coup. What happened is that the number of attacks increased in Sinai. We have now lots of groups. We have ISIL in, in Sinai. We have uh, Sinai, whatever they call it. And we have also other extremists, and we have also smugglers, and we have those who are bringing drugs and doing whatever. I mean, this number of attacks is increasing. Guess let me, hand, let me play you something. Let me play you something. I, you hardly need to be reminded, but it's a moment in history, not just for Egyptians' history, but for global history. I'm going to play this to you from five years ago from this week. To that crowd, that's what they've been waiting for. Hosni Mubarak has gone. <laughs> Not quite five years ago, that was Adrian Finnegan from uh, Al Jazeera, that was February the 11th, 2011. Kind of monumental when you look at that, I mean, how can you not get goosebumps? I got them. Oh, <laughs> exactly, I think we I'm, all, I'm, we, I'm we all have. I'm almost here. here. Yeah. yeah, okay, so that's that moment, so almost five years ago. Between then and now, what's the biggest difference, Amira, in Egypt? I would, I would say that there's two differences. One, one is we as, we as individuals have changed um, irreversibly. There's, there's nothing about our lives before revolution 
that's the same today. And, and then I think secondly that we have learned a lot about our, uh, our government and our military and we, we know that what it takes for a real democracy to be set up is not going to be by removing just Mubarak or Morsi. Um, there has to be a lot more systematic change and, and real, real overhauling of the system. I, I always get quite nervous when people say overhaul yeah. and then you've had so many yeah. successions of different leaders. And Malika, what do you have? Uh, uh, the view that has come up in this discussion already, but I want to uh, pinpoint it with this video comment from Ramesh. And basically he studied this and he talks about the continuation of a revolution and how a revolution is not just a short thing. Uh, so uh, uh, Sharif, I want you to have a listen to what Ramesh told this stream. I'm concerned that we have something of a misnomer today where we think of the Arab Spring as over and done with forever and somehow replaced by the growth of groups like ISIS and their uses of technology and their political meaning. I want us to think past that and I'm kind of curious about whether one actually thinks that the Egyptian revolution is forever finished or whether it's translated into a new imagination and a new potential. Sharifa, what do you think of his question and, and what will come next? Well, we already had some many decades of so-called revolutions under Nasser in Syria, elsewhere, and then each of them had purges uh, in Iraq and Syria and Egypt in which we were told the revolution was being revised. So I think what people have learned is, you know, revolutions don't come from the top. They don't come when there is lack of organization, unification, whatever. I mean, they don't come in a purely democratic form in which everyone is free to set up the new society. Whoever's the best organized uh, takes charge. And the best organized in this instance, some people say it was the Ikhwan, but it was the military. Mm -hmm. So they were the best organized. They have the greatest control over information. Um, and yes, I think he's right. It's a process. It's a long, it's, yeah. it's a, the goals of the Arab Spring aren't just revolution. Um, okay. the formation of new societies that bring justice, uh, you know, we'll, uh, but there are... Sharif, I, I want to hear from Baha, just before we wrap up this part of the program. Uh, Baha, you were there right at the beginning of the Arab Spring in Egypt, 2011. Two. Now, if you had to date it, 2011 to when, when would Egypt's Arab Spring be, Egypt's revolution be? You said we're not done yet. We're not done yet. Uh, the revolution will continue. The revolution will, will continue until people get their rights. As the, the video just said now, it's a matter of a process. Now, uh, and, and four years or five years in the age of countries, it not just, it's, 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 not, it's nothing. It's very sh short term, but it's continuing. We can see now the number of youth, the number, or the number of youth participating in all aspects of everything is increasing. We are seeing that on social media. Maybe one day it will return, but it re will return in a new form. No one knows exactly this new form, but people didn't give up. People are continuing dreaming of this better Egypt. We can see the criticism, we can see the building new hopes, and we're seeing what they want on the social media and on some people on the ground, and even the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. We are, we are seeing some people of them, even under this heavy security thing, we are seeing some of them for, uh, holding protests. And, and you have to say, me, it's uh, illegal to be a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. You cannot be in that organization in Egypt right now. Whatever. The regime is saying also is that April 6th is an illegal uh, terrorist organization mm -hmm. and describing good, decent gentlemen and good, decent yeah. uh, journalists like Shaukan and Ala Abdel Fattah and Fakharani and those guys, uh, describing them as, uh, as spies and traitors and whatever. <laughs> but this is wrong. So we are seeing I, I all that. I love it when a journalist so says whatever. <laughs> that's, that's the passion speaking rather than the journalism. Let me just leave it there for a moment. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I'm going to take you to the post show. It's stream.adazira.com. We will go there with a mere and Baha, Sharifa, hopefully you as well, Malika. Uh, giving the last word to Abrara, the revolution demands were bread, freedom, social justice. The revolution will continue until they're met. Thanks so much for watching. We will continue online, stream.azir.com.
Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about Egypt's revolution five years on. Let's get right back to that conversation. Emira, you were there at the beginning. You were part of the revolution, um, not necessarily out on the streets, but you were, you were there, you were supporting it. Um, if you could kind of retrace your steps and say, oh, I wish we'd done this, and then we might not have had to gone through this and this and this. Uh, fill in those blanks for us. I, w I wish I could answer that with confidence, but mm -hmm. I, I think that the the level of unpredictable like events that kept occurring, um, the the fact that we as a society weren't prepared to run a new government, uh, the civil society was barely you know barely catching on. How to could things. you be prepared to run a government? I mean, did you even, even think that okay, we are going to push back against our leadership right now? We've been leaders. For decades, mm -hmm. how are you going to have infrastructure ready for a government? Well, it's, uh, it wasn't—it wasn't possible at the time. It's impossible. And it—and it—and I think that was one of the issues: is that we needed to fill a role that we we couldn't. And it wasn't necessarily a failure. It wasn't necessarily mistakes that were made. Obviously, this was bound to happen, then, wasn't it? Lot, I mean, revolutions are hard to to, yeah. to do, and peaceful <laughs> revolutions—you can't. I mean, that's a different yeah. story, yeah. Beher. Uh, I wish. Let's say first. I wish we go back to uh, let go back to the 11th of February 2011, yeah. where that moment everybody was sitting all together, mm -hmm. different aspects, different trends, all sitting together, thinking of a better future, the bright future. And everybody was positive, and I think everybody is still positive. This is one. I think what we would avoid is what we wouldn't do is that we leave the square. We left the square very early. We talked we talk with Mubarak, and it was not only about Mubarak, it's about his regime. It's about an entire corrupt, rotten regime that is deep into every single part in the state, and uh, it's still there. So we, we, we left very early. And the other thing, the military was very smart in dividing and conquering everybody. Mm -hmm. The military started dividing the, the groups. Military start uh, putting people against each other and start taking sides. And he did the, the same thing, what he did into, in 1952, which was also a coup. Uh, what happened is that the military played it smart. The military started bringing people to his side. And we, are, we have seen picture with, uh, with CC holding talks with April 6th and the guys who are in prison now and who describe him in the past as friends and those are the bright and the future of the, and those are the, the, the future of this country. So, and what we should have, haven't done is to topple the brotherhood this way. Yes, there was lots of freedom. There was, uh, there was lots of improvement in the, uh, in the political life in Egypt. The, the Brotherhood started to lose uh, their, their presence in the syndicates. They started to lose in the, present, in the students' union. All that happened. So it was wrong. And when the, pro and the 30s of June protests took place, it was, yes, people didn't want the Brotherhood. And people have the whole right to choose and to say, we don't want you. Get out. And let me tell you this. This is something I got when I was in prison with the Brotherhood people. The Brotherhood, according to some of the, uh, I don't want to name somebody, but he's a very close aide to Morsi at that time. And he was working with him in the presidency, said, that Morsi agreed to hold presidential, an early presidential election, and he agreed to hold early referendum. So, so what it happened? was absolutely wrong. What happened is, CC wanted agree? to get rid of the Brotherhood. Yes, and the thing but is, he said he whatever didn't agree. happened. <laughs> okay. What? He said publicly he didn't agree to hold early elections, so everyone thought it's the leadership of the Ikhwan who. Yeah. No, no, no. Morsi was cut out when he was uh, at the presidency. He didn't have a chance. He was locked down. He and his presidential team in the presidential guard uh, palace or a place uh, in, in Heliopolis, they were not allowed to see anybody. They were not allowed even to, to, to sit together. It's a guess. All of them were locked down. I'm going to move on. No, just... it's not a guess. It's a fact. No, no. It's a guess. fact. I was speaking guess. with the... A guess. 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 Uh, uh, uh. So guess. I'm moving guess. on just a little bit because we could take okay. up six hours talking about this, on rehashing that. that. Yeah. So I'm going to just move forward a little bit. Malika. I, I want to play the comments of uh, someone named Iman who really just gives her statement and it's similar to some other things we've heard you all say on the show today and she describes what she thinks went wrong. The revolution was appropriated and subsequently re-narrated to support the same state power it sought to overthrow. In that sense, the revolution was truly incomplete, and it was co-opted by forces which had nothing to do with the activist and working class groups 
which instigated the uprising and invested in the revolution at times with their own lives. Um, their ambitions were not realized, and if anything, they've been derailed further by an even more oppressive state apparatus. And so, Bahir, I see you nodding there. So that point has been made. I want to pivot just a little bit to this. This is from Maryam, who sounds a little bit more optimistic than that video commenter did. And Maryam says, the revolution is still alive in the minds of the millions who took to the streets, and they will pass it on to the coming generations. Bahir, how will you address this with your kids? How will you teach them about what happened to you and what happened uh, from 2011 until now? Uh, I will just simply tell them, be free. The youth of Egypt decided to be free, decided to express their opinion, decided to say no. And I want my children to be free and to say no. Uh, I will tell them that a brave youth stood in fr and, uh, before oppression and barehanded, and they were shot at, and they were not afraid until they got their rights. Uh, everybody was very proud of the Egyptian revolution, and I heard something a few days ago where somebody was posting a video saying, even President Obama said, the Egyptian taught the world how to get their rights peacefully. So I will teach my children to be peaceful. I will teach my children to say no. I will teach my children freedom, because saying no and freedom and standing for our rights, what helped us to, to, to have this beautiful revolution. And I just want to add one more little thing as uh, the youth of the revolution, yes, the most organized people uh, or, or groups after the, the revolution was the Brotherhood and they, they had a chance to, to win the election or whatever, yes, but at the same time, the youth of the revolution had the chance to build their parties, had the chance to build a political party and to build political pre uh, presence, and many were started to join political trends and groups, and that was something very healthy for the society, and this is what we need now for Egypt. We need freedom of expression, we need freedom of forming political parties, everybody free to express his opinion and to form parties, and this is what we want now for the country. Sharifa, I mean, we did mention earlier that you had taught Sisi at the Army War College. I am curious about whether you think he's up to this task. It's a massive job right now that he has to do I don't Egypt. think any single individual is up to this huge task, and in fact, Egypt doesn't want or need one person still a president a superman it doesn't need a superman it needs people to be able to work together as we just heard in other structures it needs a balance of power it needs a parliament that is not laughable as on the first day you know that's not fighting about silly things and a judiciary uh, that can stand up so both doesn't that come from the uh, doesn't that come from the leadership how's that magically all going to happen uh, I, I, That's I what I'm asking. Is, does, doesn't it come from the leadership? The leadership is doing that comes from society. Officer. Comes from yes. Uh, this sounds uh, more like well, wishful thinking than pragmatics. I'm just trying to think pragmatically. It's like you know CC. You taught you him. Does he have the leadership no. qualities to be able to manage uh, all of those things that you're suggesting has to happen in Egypt? Okay. Look at. The military is not a single individual. The military leadership is a group. Okay, if he's acting on their behalf, that's one thing. Mm. If he's acting on behalf of Egypt, it's still wrong to constantly look for an icon, for a superhuman who's going to do everything for Egypt. It's Egyptians who your, have to do everything no, for Egypt. Are you saying, no, he's not up to the task then? Cause you that's didn't not what up. I'm saying. <laughs> then, then let me I'm, ask you again for the final time. Is he up to okay. leading Egypt? Uh, I was... I was asked to vilify him when he came into power. I'm not asking you that to do arguments that. with people. Should no, you, what, are you saying, uncomfortable actually just ask, answering very directly? Uh, I have no I strings should, to this. I'm just curious. Question. What's the right I think question? It's the wrong question? I think it's wrong to ask for Obama to do everything for the United States. I didn't ask that. Or, I just thought if you felt he had the leadership qualities. Um, I don't see what choice there was at that time. All right. Shifa, you, yeah. will, you, will, you will be forever enigmatic on that question. Meanwhile, <laughs> <laughs> let me just check in with the guests. Uh, five years on, Amira, how are you feeling? Doing very well. Life is a um, bizarre five years later, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah. But no, we're well. We, yeah. we are 
continue to work and we continue to hope for um, changes, even though a lot of changes have happened that we didn't um, want, like the mm. many, many laws that have been passed that have stripped freedoms and made You're it... You're feeling positive? Anything positive? You're feeling positive? Uh, oh. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't feel very positive about Egypt right now, but oh. I, I don't think that my emotions right at this moment will, will necessarily be the direction that it takes. And sure. we do see changes happen. We do see, um, I don't know, maybe some small things that are, that are good. Yeah. Baha. I'm very positive, very positive, because nobody, as you just said at the beginning of the program, uh, you were there in Egypt six, let's say, six weeks before, and nobody yeah. saw what happened. I had no so, idea, Baha. It was the yes, most bizarre yes. thing. And I was yes, cursing exactly. that I didn't so, have my, my trip a little bit later because then I could have been there. <laughs> I was like, how did I not know? <laughs> so I'm positive. Yeah. I'm very positive. Yeah. That because 25th of January revolution, it, it, it didn't stop. And it will not stop. And it mm. will continue. Mm. And it's, it's in the heart of the people. Uh, I'm proud. I'm mm. proud of every single person participated in the revolution. I'm also proud of the steadfastness of those who participated and organized the revolution, let's say Ahmed Maher, he's in prison now, and uh, he didn't do anything, and he's very proud, and we didn't hear that he is like giving up or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud that more than 40,000 people behind bars are still steadfast, and we, did, we didn't hear anybody breaking down and saying that, okay, I give up on the revolution. No, but I'm scared, because what I witness in prison is that there is a huge radicalization issue happening inside prisons. So that's just a scary issue, mm -hmm. but I'm positive, and I think, I, I believe that democracy and free society and freedom of expression is the only solution for our country. Mm. Interesting. All right, Sarifa, Ambaha, and Amira, it's been a fascinating conversation, so much more to talk about, but I'm going to wrap it up right now. I really appreciate your time on this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a time of the year when we're all thinking about Egypt, and it, it's really hard not, not to be wondering what will happen next. <laughs> See you this time next year. Malika. Indeed. <laughs> and so we're done. Thank you very much, everybody, for being in the stream today. We appreciate your time. Take care.